It's with great pleasure I um, thank you. introduce Dr. Christian Thomas. Christian is a nutritionist and clinical exercise physiologist with a special interest in diet and exercise for optimal physical and mental function. He's an experienced university lecturer, has a passion for communicating research to students and the general public. He's also founder of Built for Motion and Nutritionist at Squirrel Yoga, providing nutrition solutions for the turbocharged brain. So it's with great pleasure I get to introduce Dr. Christian Thomas. Thank you very much for that introduction. Oh, microphone is working great. So, uh, always a bit of a stupid question, but can everyone hear me even at the back? If you can't hear me, raise your hand. You can tell why that's not a very smart question. But it, I got the thumbs up, which means you actually can hear me. If you'd indulge me just for a moment, this, this talk, I would like to think, is, is full of tips. If not, I won't, won't call them solutions, but full of tips. And I'd like you to actually practice the first one. So, if this works. Let's take a moment, join me in this one, breathe in, take about a count of three to breathe in, even close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that. Hold that breath just for a count of slow, count of two, breathe out for a count of four, if you can manage that nice and slowly. Okay. Hold for a count of two, the out breath, breathe in and if you would just Repeat that cycle one more time. If you're wondering what does this have to do with nutrition, fair enough. Uh, but it's not the only thing I teach. The fancy words, okay. Sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Some of you may have heard that. Others may have heard of the fight or flight, or fight, flight and fright response. And the rest and digest response. You can imagine that people with ADHD, find it very easy to occupy that space over there. Okay? We've, we've heard about it multiple times today, in fact. That all go, fight, flight, getting a reaction, that brain state. And we need that. We've needed that for survival all this time. We sometimes need to be there. But there's a reason this other side is often just called the rest and digest response. That's where we want to be when we're eating. Blood supply goes to the right places, not to the heart, not well, of course it goes through the heart, but it's not supplying the heart with oxygen, it's not going to the muscles, anything like that, adrenal isn't high, no. Nice and relaxed, blood goes to the intestinal organs, to where you digest food. That's the state we want to be in when we're eating, and it doesn't take much. Our breath is generally the gateway of switching from one to the other, something as simple as slowing down the breath helps you shift over that side. Incidentally, to some extent, so does eating. But you want your body to be prepared for the food before you start putting it in. Okay, I think once the research is done, we'll even show that eating in an, in an agitated state, in that red zone, is probably part of what's causing a lot of problems with poor digestion, with immune reactions to the food. Kind of hard to show in the science, but I'd say one day we will prove that. Okay, so that's the breath part over. I accept, and I hopefully all of you accept, that everyone is different, okay? And just because someone has a diagnosis of ADHD doesn't suddenly mean, hey, their whole biology works in one specific way. Sure, there are commonalities, but there is no such thing as an ADHD diet. So I'm not going to tell you there's an ADHD diet, and anyone who sells that, okay? Uh, I call bull, and we'll leave out the other word because there are young people here. I do, okay? People are way too different. So I'm not here to tell you, definitely do this. However, I know that there are a lot of solutions put out there on the web and so on, and they can certainly be useful. They've clearly helped some of the people who promote it, or they've helped them help their clients. I'm not denying that. I want you to be slightly critical of them, but most importantly, I'd like you leaving this talk Having an understanding of how you can try out whether that is a suitable solution for you. Because a lot of people say they've, they've tried everything. And when I talk to them, the problem isn't they, they haven't tried everything, it's how they've tried everything. And you'll, you'll hopefully see what I mean shortly. So we're accepting a few common challenges and 
even if it doesn't look like I'm addressing them directly, a more appropriate to the person diet will address these. So medication suppresses appetite, which in kids, from what I've seen, often leads to trouble gaining weight or maintaining weight in the usual way. On the other hand, oh, we're getting a bit dark there. Um, with adults, if anything, the problem is often more impulsive eating. Okay? Not organized, not able to have breakfast in the morning because trying to get somewhere on time, so we skip that. Don't have a good meal, so either it's a meal from the vending machine or no meal at all until evening, and then it's whatever's readily available because we're ridiculously hungry. And of course, that can lead to weight gain. And even if it doesn't, it's not the best for health. Self-medication, we just heard that. Food can be a way of self-medicating. Not always a bad way. It could be a, a way of trying to make the most of the many positives of ADHD. But it can also be a way of trying to pick up mood, um, simulation, fight fatigue. Not always for the better. What seems to come out time and time again is that people with ADHD just seem to be less resistant to problems that we, we all face if we're having too much toxic load from our environment, too many things that aren't that great for us, we just seem to be more sensitive to it. And in those people who are sensitive, it can really ramp up the symptoms. And food hypersensitivities, okay, a fancy way of basically saying allergies and intolerances. Okay. Uh, there's an old saying, the dose makes the poison. So all of us have a certain capacity for things, but this varies from person to person. And there's every reason to believe that more often than not in ADHD, that capacity is going to be lower. So we need to look at that. And there seems to be, it seems to be the case that people with ADHD tend to be more prone to autoimmune disease. What am I talking about? Celiac disease, uh, autoimmune thyroid conditions, autoimmune skin conditions. It seems to be more common. I'm not saying everyone with ADHD has them or will have them. It just seems to be more common, so it's another thing to look out for because food is almost certainly the common link there. What we'll be looking at today is a little bit about foundations of diet. Okay, there are some fundamentals that are universal. Specific nutrients and supplements that seem to be popular or often uh, make it into websites about ADHD. Don't make it so much into a lot of the research, unfortunately. Reducing toxic load generally because of that lower apparent tolerance. Healthy gut equals happy brain. Very popular at the moment, I'd say very true. Looking at allergies and intolerances and how to uh, go about addressing them, but also how to <coughs> get them diagnosed in the first place. And another popular thing is sort of low sugar, low carbohydrate, but again, it's where people think they're doing it, but they often uh, get it wrong because there are just some misconceptions out there about what's in food. And thought I'd fix the names, but basically, these, these are your nutrients. This, this is what you read about, vitamins, minerals, and so on. Down this end, we need them in tiny amounts, but if they're essential, we still need them to live, no matter how tiny that amount is. At the other end, you know, it's, it's the big stuff. Steak, what a protein in it, fat. Have it by gram amounts a day, fiber, and so on. Now, there are the essential ones, and the non-essential ones. The essential ones are the ones we want to need to base our diet around. So please never lose sight of that. A chief complaint or a chief concern with starting to cut a lot of things out of the diet is, okay, well, maybe we're going to miss out on stuff. So we do need to make sure ourselves, or by getting professional help and guidance, that you know, we, keep, we keep what's absolutely necessary in. The next few slides will have information from this resource. So Australia and New Zealand share these nutrient reference values. They, roughly speaking, tell us at any given age group uh, how much of a certain vitamin or mineral people need. I, I would say ignore the, the other information that's in there, but that can be quite useful because at the extreme end, there's the risk of toxicity. So sorry for those not so mathematically minded. Neither am I, by the way, I hate statistics. But basically, we know roughly what half of healthy people need in this group, and we have this value that you often read about. Sometimes it's the RDI, sometimes it's abbreviated RDA, does it really matter? Basically, if someone's having that amount, 
and their health is generally good. And you can always debate whose health is good. But if their health is generally good, the chance that they're, getting, they're not getting enough is very, very low. Okay? This will supply enough for 97.5% of the population. Number's not so important. But I'd like you to be aware of this. Okay? A lot of people probably think, hey, vitamins, minerals, we need these. These are natural things. They're good for us. More must be better. Some interesting research coming out of Canterbury that might give you that idea as well. Uh, not quite. Not quite. Okay? Most people will be catered to by the time they get this amount, whatever that is. And by the time they start getting in this category, especially after several days, they may or may not get problems arising. Okay, this is an individual thing. Some argument is there that some people with ADHD, maybe many people with ADHD, have rare genetic mutations, that, and, and they need much more. Please, if you're going, thinking about getting much more than is what is recommended, especially once it gets into that potential danger zone, do it under some kind of supervision and do it looking out for side effects. So too little is a deficiency, absolutely. And we get worried about that. But too much is toxicity, even if it's a vitamin, even if it's a mineral. Natural can be risky too. And I'm including herbals and all kinds of things. Okay, natural can absolutely be risky. Many natural things are poisonous and toxic. And dose makes the poison. Supplements are less tightly regulated than medicines. Now, I'm a nutritionist. I'm certainly not here to push medication, but please be aware, more research, more rigor goes into those things because of the stringent approval processes than goes into making supplements. There's more money in it, therefore there's more money for research, sadly the way the world works. And you're not as guaranteed with a supplement that what's in the label, or rather what's on the label is in the bottle. I've said that already. And consider this, if it has an effect, some people like to go on about how potent a certain natural thing is. If it has an effect, it can have a side effect. That's the nature of biology. If it does one thing really well, you cannot possibly guarantee that it does something else or doesn't do something else as well. So what are some of the common supplements, certainly that I've read about online and I've seen some research into? Uh, zinc is a popular one. Now we already know, this is for the general population, this isn't specific to ADHD, that about a quarter of New Zealanders aren't getting enough. So maybe if you're thinking about a nutrient supplement, might not be the best, uh, might not be the worst place to start. It may help people with ADHD. Whether it does or it doesn't depends on whether they're not getting enough zinc in the first place. It's not magical, it's just a nutrient. If there's a deficiency there, maybe that is making symptoms worse. Fixing that deficiency, you would then expect to make symptoms better. But that's it. There's no magic beyond that. Uh, the tests for the deficiency aren't the greatest, so do get some medical guidance in this. But if, you, if you're worried about yourself having a deficiency, your child having a deficiency, most of these can be tested. And they can be tested through, uh, if you're in Auckland, lab tests. Through the normal stuff your doctor can order. You don't have to send samples overseas, which I would strongly counsel against. Point I'd like to make, I talked about the whole toxicity thing. So these are from that, those nutrient reference values, roughly what a person needs at a given age group. So we need more as we get older, generally. Makes sense, we get larger. Right? We, get, we need more medication as well. Notice that the men, the recommendation for men, is slightly above the upper safe level for a young child. <coughs> So I guess one take home message is please don't give children the adult dose. And if you're going to give them a dose that's considerably above 12 milligrams a day, make sure it's under advice. And make sure someone's checking in every so often that this isn't doing any harm, that this is just doing good or at least is neutral. Iron is another common one. I've seen research show that, hey, iron levels are lower in ADHD. Another piece of research says, hey, they're, they're higher. Because it's an average. Iron is the easiest thing in the world to test. Regularly gets tested. Okay, so all you need to do, if that's a concern, get it tested. See what the, what the iron levels are. Here, well, we can see that one group, okay, pregnant women, their recommended daily, re the actual requirement is a, above what's toxic for a one to three year old. Probably toxic for them. Not for every one to three year old, but I wouldn't be giving mine that much. Iodine is low in New Zealand soil and low in New Zealand food, and we have an iodine deficiency problem in New Zealand. Okay? And uh, 
That deficiency certainly can cause IQ reductions. I've seen work recently come out that um, suggests iodine is lower in some with ADHD, but again, hey, maybe they just took them from a group of people, from a large group of people where that's lower. But in New Zealand, do think about where is your iodine coming from? Okay, uh, child may not be getting enough iodine. Have a look at that. It's very important for brain development. But again, we need to be careful, okay? A, a, a little goes a long way when it comes to iodine. And finally, selenium is kind of in that same category. It's low in our soils in New Zealand, and it's low in our diet. And you, know, you can see there, roughly half of New Zealand women and a third of males have low intakes. So again, that might be something to address. And it's linked a bit like iodine with the thyroid, and the thyroid is linked with brain development. So there is an indirect link there, even though I've never seen selenium recommended. Maybe that's just because they weren't dealing with a New Zealand population that's low. So the key points. What one person requires might be more than as good for another person. So more is definitely not always better. Age-appropriate supplements, if you go with supplement way, please don't give adult supplements to a child, or at least not, not unless it's under supervision. Get things tested, and then if you get things tested and there does appear to be a deficiency, and you go out and you get the required supplement, and you try and fix that deficiency, get it tested again. See if it's actually made the difference. Um, because, just because we, we put it in our mouths and we swallow it doesn't mean we absorb it. And I'll touch on this again later on uh, when we talk a little bit about that whole healthy, or a healthy gut, happy brain. Keep doing that. So, fish oil? Anyone use fish oil themselves? Or fish? Okay, right. So, it's an interesting one. Uh, research is a bit, a bit here and a bit there. There are reasons for that. We, spend the next 30 minutes just talking about those reasons, so let's, let's not go there. If you're going for a supplement, make sure most of what's in there is the stuff called EPA and DHA. They're the specific fats you're interested in. And if you pick up most supplement bottles, you'll see that maybe half of it's the stuff. Now, you won't get anything that's purely the stuff, or probably won't get anything, but compare bottles and pick the one that's the highest. Now, in New Zealand, we have this habit of uh, putting high potency on a bottle, that usually means I'm just putting more in each capsule. That's not higher potency. It's just the equivalent of having two capsules instead of one. So do a comparison. How much is in there? I can't tell you what you should go for. It's more a case of compare your options and then just pick the highest one. Something you can do if you're taking it already is rather than having the recommended daily dose, I'll leave that up to the bottle to recommend. I'll leave that responsibility with the manufacturer. But instead of having that on a daily basis, have it two or three times a week. It turns out that if you have it as recommended on a daily level, you just burn that fat. You just use it as energy. A lot of it, not all of it. If you have that in, small, in, in larger doses, but less frequently, then more of it actually goes to where you want it to, which is like brain tissue, nervous tissue. Tissue in the body. It's not just burned. So that's one hopefully useful tip for people who take it. However, okay, one caution. Up until about a year ago, I would have recommended this across the board for almost everyone. Now I have to be cautious because some work, and this was done actually in New Zealand, has come out and said, hey, a lot of the fish oil being sold is, is oxidized. The rest of us would call it somewhat rancid. I'm not saying completely rancid, but at least somewhat rancid. You do not want to be putting oxidized or rancid oil in the body. It, it will, the, the harms outweigh the benefits. Now, unfortunately, what this research didn't show is a really nice way of us to know. It was across manufacturers, a, a supplement being more expensive, having a different label and so on, did not seem to make a difference. Okay, so I'd like to put out a better message out there, but I wouldn't be telling you what I know. Uh, my recommendation, really, all you can do is when you get the bottle off the shelf, when you bring it home, open one or two of those capsules up, okay? It should not have a really yucky smell. If you've ever had fish oil burps, you know it's not the nicest taste or smell, but it should be like bringing home fresh salmon. If it's got a fishy taste or a really strong smell, 
it's probably partially rancid. I don't think you'll be able to take it back to the store, unfortunately, but um, I get, at least the good news is this. They didn't show that the more expensive stuff was any better than the less expensive stuff. So maybe go for the less expensive stuff and throw out every few bottles that don't smell right, okay? Um, I wish I could give you something more solid than that, but that's the situation we're in for now. Maybe regulations will change around this once sometime in the future. The other one, I was surprised about this, is, okay, this gamma linoleic acid. Most of us may know it as an ingredient in evening primrose oil. This actually has about as much supportive research as fish oil. So that's another place you can go. I think this is more stable, chemically more stable, less likely to be ranted. Uh, but uh, just because I haven't read there's a problem with it doesn't mean it definitely isn't. But you may want to think about giving both evening primrose and fish oil. Citicoline, does anyone get it? May have heard of people getting it from iHerb over in the US. Probably not called that, but that's what's in the bottle. Okay, it has a few other names. Citidine 5-diphosphocholine. Okay. Uh, I know some people have used this because I've spoken to them. There really isn't work in ADHD as such, but what makes a supplement interesting, and I think worth a try, is that in some countries it's actually used as a, as a post-stroke medication to help with neurological things, to help with, uh, with control, to help with the nervous system. And work not in ADHD kids specifically, but in adolescents has shown that you know, around about this dose, 250 to 500 milligrams, up to about 1,000 milligrams, helped with attention and accuracy, and helped with um, speed, if you're interested in that. I've told ADHD people already, they can be quite fast. But intention and accuracy, of course, is a key thing. And because it's, it's essentially a medication, a prescribed medication in some countries, it's been relatively thoroughly researched for safety. A little bit of caution. Compared to medication, less research is done in supplements. And there's less regulation. I know we sometimes hear about regulations coming in threatening the supply of our beloved supplement. And, and that may be true, but overall food and medications are more tightly regulated than supplements. I used to work for the New Zealand and Australian food regulator. I'm pretty confident about this one. So keep, keep that in mind. Use a supplement. But if you don't think it's doing any extra good, maybe move on to something else rather than loading up one supplement after another, okay? You, you want to minimize risk here to get, get the most benefit. Overall toxic load, mentioned that maybe ADHD people are a lot more sensitive to what's in the environment, including food, not just food. One thing is this stuff, okay? All these processing agents, and we know, we heard about the coloring, all these food-like products. Okay? I don't call this food, these are food-like products just been deluded into thinking these are food. And these are not very good for our, our bowels. Uh, more and more people, backed somewhat by research, are saying that, hey, there seems to be a link between this stuff and autoimmune diseases. And there's a link between autoimmune diseases and ADHD. So that's a bit tenuous, uh, but none of us need this stuff. Okay? None of us need what's in this stuff. And if we don't need it, that's the first thing to cut out. If we know no one needs it, let's get rid of it entirely. Another thing is if you're thinking of that whole um, organic you know, versus conventionally grown thing, and money's tight okay, for a lot of people, uh, I'd like to buy more organic stuff, but it's often two, three times as expensive. So if you have some budget, but it's limited, the Dirty Dozen here, uh, this is from the US, but it turns out in New Zealand, much the same. They have the highest herbicide pesticide load, both in the amount and the variety of different herbicides and pesticides. Those I would leave out or go organic. Or grow your own. Fantastic. Grow your own. Have your own garden. The Clean 15, maybe don't worry so much about getting these organic and uh, have, have more of those. They have fewer pesticides, fewer herbicides. Another thing is cooking. I uh, certainly tend to follow this advice myself. Cook with things like steel, iron, wood, glass. 
Um, avoid aluminium. Avoid, mm, I wouldn't cook with, cook or, with or in plastics. They, they can be handy for storing things, but at you know, relatively cold temperatures so you don't get what's in the plastic leaching into your food. Uh, aluminium, incidentally, uh, if you look at what it does at toxic levels, looks a lot like the symptoms of ADHD. So we don't want to make those any worse. Whereas these other things, especially, so if, let's say you have someone who has uh, an issue, they're not getting that much iron, they don't have very high iron levels. Well, using cast iron cookware will, will help. They use it in countries where iron, or have trialed it in countries where getting enough iron is a real problem for people. Uh, on the other hand, it's, some people, about one in 200 people, are prone to get too much iron from their diet, even if it's a normal amount of iron. If you have one of those, and again, it's easy to test, you definitely do not want to be using iron cookware. I'm not talking about stainless steel, okay, but not cast iron cookware. So it just depends on the group. Let items that you buy, furniture and so on, off gas. Uh, it can take a while. Okay? Off gassing just means all the things you smell. If you walk into a room and it smells new, okay, it smells like you know that person's got a new couch or they've painted the wall. That, well, that smell is getting into your body and probably isn't the best for you. So we tend to leave things we buy new in the garage for a few weeks. If it's something you can leave outside, fantastic, but obviously if new furniture, you don't want to leave it outside in the rain. Control mold can be a real issue for people. In New Zealand, we have a lot of mold in homes. We have quite damp homes, and we have a heck of a lot of asthma. And ADHD and asthma, again, very, uh, well, it's linked in terms of people that actually often have asthma. So, and mold can be a real issue there. And ventilate. In Auckland, probably not just true for Auckland, but in Auckland, uh, generally indoor air pollution is worse because of all these things off-gassing and because of mould and damp and so on than standing outside, even though they think, well, but if I'm outside and maybe I'm near a road, well, okay, maybe indoor air pollution isn't, uh, isn't as bad as standing in the middle of the harbour bridge at peak time, but indoor is often worse than outdoor, so ventilate and get outside. I mentioned this, healthy gut, happy brain, very popular at the moment. Imagine your bowels, your intestines, like cheesecloth. Cheesecloth is meant to let some things through, right? That's our vitamins, our minerals, our proteins, and so on. It's meant to let that stuff through. Things in our food, some things in our food, punch holes in it. Then we start getting things in partly or largely undigested, and that probably is the start of autoimmunity. And it's certainly not good for someone who has an intolerance or an allergy or something like that. So we want to try and avoid that. Hopefully some of you are Lord of the Rings fans. Another way to imagine it is you've got what we call the intestinal barrier. That's just, you know, the, the cells. And we've got the immune system right behind that. Most of your immune system is around your bowels for good reason. Because it's this, it's this connection between the outside and the inside world. And it's a connection unlike our skin, for example, it's a connection that needs to work to let things in and let things out, but selectively. When we have things like gluten uh, emulsifiers, it's what helps uh, liquids and fats, fats and water mix basically, uh, a lot of sugar, organic solvents, which are used in processing, especially seed oils and things like that. When we have a lot of those, they basically attack this intestinal barrier and give our immune system a pretty hard time. That's the, uh, the geeky version of this. I like the Lord of the Rings version better. So gluten-free, who's, who's on it, tried it, thought about it? Any of those? OK. Cool. A number of reasons to go gluten-free. Uh, weed allergy, pretty uncommon. Celiac disease, mm, getting more common. Can't remember the statistic off the top of my head. And yes, uh, people who are on gluten with celiacs a lot of the symptoms can look a lot like ADHD. And there seems to be more celiac disease than ADHD, but studies vary a little bit about, uh, around that. So I'm not going to say that with a huge amount of confidence. We have a whole other category, though. Pretty new, 
And so, still somewhat contentious, but getting less and less contentious as more and more research is done. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which means you can go in or you can take your child in and they can do all the appropriate tests for celiac disease and they will tell you, doesn't have celiac disease, gluten's fine. Not the case. Not necessarily the case. Okay, if you had to cut anything out, um, you can do a pretty good overhaul of a diet by thoroughly cutting out gluten. As in, you'll, you'll get lots of other things right as well. And you may very well be dealing with this, or your child may very well be dealing with this. And there isn't a surefire way of diagnosing it at the moment. But if you cut out gluten and symptoms get better, maybe it's the gluten, maybe it's other stuff you've cut out. Thanks. Uh, but hey, you're getting the desired effect. So who cares so much about the reason? If it is because of the immune system, a little can be all it takes. And this is where I think a lot of people who try gluten-free think they've tried gluten-free and it didn't work, where they may have been missing out on an opportunity. In the extreme cases, not saying you or your child are an extreme case, but you don't know. 20 parts per million, or in normal terms, one crumb. One crumb from a normal piece of bread is enough to make some celiacs get their symptoms back. That's not much. And this is where gluten hides. Okay, so yes, you, I, I get it. You understand wheat and you get, understand pasta and you understand bread and you've cut that out, but things haven't gotten better, so gluten can't be the problem. Well, what about all this stuff? It's in a lot of chocolate. It's not in cocoa. It's just in a lot of chocolate products. It's in a lot of sweets. Cross-contamination just means, hey, um, battered fish goes into the oil and then chips go into that same oil. No, there was no flour on the chips, but now they've been in the same oil. And it, all it takes is a crumb's worth of gluten or what's in one crumb. Sauces and gravies and stocks, especially if you buy them, often contain this stuff. Okay, gluten is a bunch of proteins. It's what makes, if you've ever baked your own bread, it's what gives it that, that spongy, sticky quality. Okay. There's something else that gives a spongy, sticky quality too when it comes out the other end, but I won't mention that. Let your imaginations fill in for that. Beer is made from barley. It's not wheat, but it has similar proteins. It can contaminate copper, you know, all these things. Supplements, you wouldn't think so, having something healthy, but it might be in there. In some places, less so in New Zealand, but I know in the US, it's even in medication. And in ludicrous medication, thyroid medication. In some thyroid medication. Which is a little bit crazy because probably there's a pretty strong connection between what I mean, thyroid disease and gluten. And in cosmetics, and unfortunately, toiletries and cosmetics don't need to be labeled with it. So if you suspect that maybe you are dealing with pretty high level of sensitivity, maybe worth contacting the manufacturers. They're not legally obliged to um, put it on the label as they are with food, but they will be able to tell you whether they use gluten. Probably where it's manufactured. So I'm not saying all coffee has gluten. Probably not. No, it, usually, because coffee's a food, as in it's uh, regulated as a food, um, you can probably find it'll, it may say, you know, processed in the same plant. That's cross-contamination, particularly problematic in, in, um, in restaurants. Now, there is something you can do. Uh, sorry, I don't have a picture of it. I meant to, but I forgot. Uh, you can now get an enzyme that breaks down gluten. You can, you can take the enzyme. You have to take it at the time, and this is not, this is not so you can go out and have a pasta meal, just, just to be clear. But if you go out, you know, you sometimes have to eat out, and you can't, you ask but you don't know whether there's cross-contamination. You think there might be some gluten there. Get yourself a few of these um, capsules. Health food shop can point you to the right direction. You know, have it at the same time just to be safe. So it's not so you can go out and go about business as usual, um, but it is a just-in-case. So never assume, please read the label, contact the manufacturer if, if it's not a food label. <laughs> also cross-reaction. Cross, so I know we've had cross twice. Contamination is Somehow some gluten gets onto some places where it shouldn't. It's also cross-reaction. I know some people, for example, who also react to oats, even, even gluten-free oats. So some people react to oats because they're often contaminated from flour, and some react to oats simply because, for them, what's in oats is similar enough to what's in wheat and barley and so on. So their immune system it looks similar enough. Okay? Call it friendly fire. Hey, it looked like the enemy, therefore we're going to react to it. Dairy, maybe that's because of similarities again, or maybe it's just a lot of people with 
problems with gluten also happen to have problems with dairy. And any, any grain is a possibility, okay? It's, it's probably unlikely, but it's a possibility. And some people with these gluten sensitivities, whether it's celiacs or the other kinds, find they don't really get big improvements until they go off some of these other grains as well. So please don't lose hope. There's always somewhere new to look. But if you're going to cut loads of things out of your diet, do consider seeing someone just to make sure that what's left in is going to be enough. Enough minerals, enough vitamins, and so on. Just to acknowledge these are also common allergies. They're common in ADHD, but they're common in the rest of the population as well. Just places you can look. I'd start with these ones first before you suspect something really rare and unusual. Just to make this point again, a little is all it takes when it comes to the immune system. So think about vaccines. Just in the context of it's a tiny, tiny amount that gets injected into you. And it gives you immunity for years, is the hope. For years. Now you have that, if you're truly sensitive, and you have an immune response to gluten or dairy proteins or anything else, it can take sometimes weeks for the immune system to calm fully back down. Okay, so when it comes to anything with the immune system, it's basically all or nothing. When it comes to other intolerances, um, we'll skip that one. Other intolerances, it's a little bit different. So these aren't, these intolerances don't really involve the immune system, so you're not, you basically get over it after a few days. Body gets rid of the stuff, that's fine. So intolerances may make symptoms worse, so they're similar, similar to allergies in that respect, but they are, they're an, an, an amount of dose, okay? Um, maybe you can't have loads of foods with, with salicylates, but you have, don't have to cut them out completely. Everyone will have to find out their own level. It's a little bit different. Moving along. Now, I know um, you can send out hair samples to supposedly find out whether you might have a nutrient deficiency and how much you need of stuff. Mm. Uh, I know you can send out blood samples, but it, when it comes to intolerances and uh, allergies, this remains what you know, the most conventional people use and, and what the less conventional people should be using as well. Elimination diets, please under supervision, and then after all the likely suspects have been eliminated, usually for a few weeks, slowly introducing one by one the suspects back in and seeing what happens. Okay, but honestly, this is you know, best done maybe with a registered dietitian, immunologist, that kind of thing. So, uh, low sugar. Low sugar or low carbohydrate is popular. That's great. Um, it's one way of eating. But let's understand that a little bit. All of these things are sugars and or starches, so carbohydrates. All of these are rich in them. Yeah, there's some other stuff in there as well, but these are all very high carbohydrate foods. So we recognize that. Even, even the fruit, still high carbohydrate food. So depending on how low you want to go, how sensitive you think you or your child are to sugar, it may mean cutting out some or all of these. Uh, some of them are also pretty high in gluten, as you will have noticed. So sugar goes by a lot of different names. Anything that has sugar after it, it's sugar, okay? Anything that has syrup after it, which means something like a sweet, sticky liquid. It's sweet, it has sugar. Please don't be fooled by things that's oh, sugar-free, but we have maltodextrin, or even concentrated fruit juice. You squeeze the, the liquid out of a fruit, what you mostly get is sugar and water. You then concentrate that down so that there's, there's less water, leaves you with sugar. They're hiding in plain sight, and some, some manufacturers who do know better, and some well-meaning people who maybe don't, have the audacity to suggest that because their sweetness comes from one of these, their product is low or no sugar. No, that's just factually false. Condiments have a lot of sugar in them, or can do, unless you make them yourself and you know what's in them. So, number of sugar cubes. These are the three main sugars, okay, we have in our diet. Glucose, another name for sugar. Fructose, you might call it fruit sugar. Galactose, probably never heard of it, but it's half of lactose, which you probably have heard of, because a lot of people are intolerant to it, and it's what's in milk. So, it's these building blocks, right? Glucose, galactose, and so on, that make up even starch, even so-called complex or low GI carbohydrates, same stuff. And we have these amazing things called enzymes 
in our bowels and they break this stuff down into mostly glucose, some of the other stuff, and our liver converts all of that stuff into glucose. Okay. There really isn't a massive distinction between complex and simple carbohydrates and low and high GI. There is a little bit of one. It depends on how low carbohydrate you're looking at going, though. I don't make much of a distinction. Maybe I have a bit of a bias because I deal also with lots of people with diabetes and they have a real sugar intolerance. What do you think? Um, which is higher in sugar, tomato juice, or this particular one, Camel's tomato juice, or Coke? Who says Coke? Who says tomato juice? What about Red Bull versus just juice, orange, and apple? Who says Red Bull? Who says just juice, orange, and apple? So that's the number of teaspoons of sugar rounded to the nearest half teaspoon, okay? And not being that precise, in these various drinks per 200 ml. So I'm going to say 200 ml is roughly a glass. Some glasses are a bit bigger or smaller, but you get an idea. It's quite a bit. It's teaspoons of sugar hiding away in there. What can you do? I know this is all a big ask. Um, I'll, I'll address what you can do with kids first. Not making any guarantees, but here are some ideas. Involve them in the shopping experience. Okay. Um, I can understand why maybe that's not always an option, but if you can involve them, involve them in that experience. Gardening. You know, it's outdoor, fresh air, physical activity. You're not sitting in a chair, it's not boring, or it doesn't have to be boring. Involve them in preparation. Yeah, yeah at first you'll get a big mess, but it's probably, it's probably worth getting the mess and having to clean that up and having the battle at the table later on year after year or day after day. And just a little plug for going back to tradition. Uh, if you can sit around the table eating food rather than everyone eating their own food at the television. Um, these guys have put some effort into really trying to sell vegetables to kids. So supersprouts.com. Um, if we're dealing with adults, stick to the outside aisle of the supermarket. The, these are the, the meat, the fish, the poultry, uh, obviously the vegetables. Dairy is a bit more processed, but hey, if dairy intolerance isn't or allergy isn't there, fine. Avoid shopping while hungry. Okay, impulse. Even worse when you're hungry. And that's that's for all of us, ADHD or not. But hey, if impulsivity is heightened, it just makes it that much more likely. A shop from a list. Okay, not by impulse, and buy only what you intend to eat. Look, if I have it in my home, it's going to get eaten by me eventually. I, I might say it's for someone coming to visit, I might say it's for the grandkids, I might, unless they come today, I'm going to eat it or drink it, even though I would never recommend it, I don't like being a hypocrite. If it tastes good and it's in my home, I will eat it, I will drink it. I've got a bottle of Sprite at the moment because of upset tummies. I've had most of it. I didn't have upset I wasn't the one with the upset tummy. <laughs> tastes good. Wouldn't recommend it, but it tastes good. Can't help myself. Uh, look, forward planning, I know, and ADHD, it seems like an oxymoron, right? Forward planning and ADHD. Seems like uh, two can't go together. But by managing it once a week and preparing food, that's many, many meals that week of temptation avoided. So, if that ability is indeed limited, surely you want to put all that power into that one time. Have the food prepared, have it ready to go. Disguising for yourself or children, food. Blender, great. And so is a juicer. Juice, I'm, I'm talking more, f more vegetable juices, but by all means put like one lone apple in there to give it some sweetness. Pureed soups, juices, homemade sauces and gravies. I have um, uh, can't quite describe the family connection. A relatively young girl in my life won't eat veg, won't eat onions, or pick them out, even quite small bits of onions, unless I puree them in a curry. Suddenly it's tasty. Do the same with the thing with tomatoes, capsicums, and so on. You can make your own sorbet, ice blocks, whatever. Freeze the juice that you make. Superfoods. I'm going to start the myth busting shortly. I'm probably over time. Uh, 
Which one do you think is a superfood? Just call it out. Which, is, which do you think is the most nutrient rich? That's what I should have said. Chia seeds? Liver. Okay. Now, okay, I get it if you don't like liver. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily eat the liver in some countries. Uh, but uh, grass fed, maybe preferably organic, New Zealand uh, wildlife or even domesticated wildlife. It's nutrient rich, it's where we store many of our minerals and vitamins. It beats the pants of all those other ones. We've just been led to believe that uh, vegetables and fruit are the be all and end all. So quick, quick myth busters. Um, my argument is that there is no such thing as an ADH diet. That doesn't mean there isn't a diet to suit a person ADHD or not, but it's just personal. Totally disagree with this. That serious, so-called serious medical conditions, if you want to call it that or not, I'm not trying to make that judgment call, um, that can't be treated by a nutritionist, it's ridiculous. What we eat, what we breathe, what we drink is what makes us, literally. Okay, there is no more potent force than that. What we think is also pretty potent too, so I'm not suggesting that's unimportant. But if we think about thoughts, we kind of, kind of eat them. We have them in here. Okay? Um, food, air, liquids that we drink, that makes us up. T to suggest that that can't help with most things. Help, didn't say cure or avoid, with most things is, is ridiculous. To me, that's a completely busted myth. All natural, again, I was in the food regulation, and I can tell you we can't regulate this term. No one agrees. What's natural here? Right. Uh, that's iodine, by the way, out of the ground. Hey, we need that stuff. Maybe not out of the ground. I'd, I'd argue that's the most natural thing up there. So, <coughs> natural, no. Don't, 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 don't be deceived by that. Same thing, natural does not mean safe. If the person telling you, hey, this is such potent stuff, well, if it's potent, if a medication is potent, it probably have pot may have potent side effects. I'm not saying don't go natural, I'm just saying, Keep an eye on it like you would on anything else. If it's helping, fantastic. If it's not obviously helping, try something else and move on. And if something's going wrong, maybe it's the natural stuff that's causing it. It can, it may or may not be safe, but natural does not categorically mean safe. No, these are not sugar alternatives, these are sugar. I mean, okay, I know that's dried fruit. I'm not saying never have dried fruit, but think about it again. What's left after you take? the water out of fruit. It's mostly the sugar. Probably you've dried out and destroyed most of the vitamins. Supplements with ADHD? Yep. Plausible. For you, for your child, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Try it out. Be your own scientist. Reading labels is a smart thing to do. Okay? You, you, when you start reading labels, your world changes. Maybe you're already doing it, so your world's already changed. But the stuff they put in, um, challenge you to compare Nutrigrain with Cocoa Pops. At least once upon a time, almost exactly the same. Even though one is for Iron Men and one is for monkeys, yeah? Cocoa Pops? <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone's needs are different. You're not defined by a label. Uh, but of course, yeah. That, that may mean you need more of something or less of something or to be more careful. And I'm also not saying that nutrition is a be all and end all. Okay. Multimodal approach, absolutely. All these things, exercise can help hugely. Sort of the other half of myself, as it were, is, is very exercise focused. Um, representing all these groups, even though I lecture full time at AUT, nothing I have said here today should be associated with AUT. It is not their opinion, it is mine. <laughs> okay, uh, if we've got time, I'm more than happy to take a few questions. Thank you. Questions. And just to emphasize a theme largely ignored for the day, when you have a question, stand up so we can all hear. Any questions? I've got one. What about Diet Coke, Coke Zero? Um, okay. So, wish I could give a very simple answer. I can give a short answer though, which is good. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. Okay, I wouldn't do it. A um, couple of reasons. Even though the harms of things like aspartam by the, the really st strong anti-campaigners, I think, are overstated. Uh, still, I can't hand on heart say that, yeah, this stuff is good for you. 
and it's definitely something our bodies don't need. So again, if I'm following very simple rules, if we don't need it, if it has no, if it doesn't have a, a benefit, if it's not essential, maybe it can go. Not sure, zero, whether it, does that have, I'm not quite sure what it has. Um, artificial sweeteners, by the way, another label reading thing, often contain lactose, of all things. So if you're putting artificial sweetener in and you're lactose intolerant, double check what your artificial sweetener has. But I, I wouldn't go there. And the other reason I wouldn't go for artificially sweetened stuff uh, is that in some people, not all people, but in some people it actually drives hunger. It's like their body's almost saying, hey, you cheated me. I thought I was getting sugar and I wasn't. Now I'm going to make you eat. So uh, simple answer, I wouldn't, I wouldn't drink the stuff. I'd actually go for the sugared stuff instead. Lesser of two eagles. Very short answer, no I don't, and I'd say even though I, I recognise it, it's, it is out of my area in terms of, I don't have any particular in-depth knowledge of salicylates. I would say, again, with respect to all the salicylates, I'm, I'm glad you've asked about that. Sorry, if people didn't hear, it was other than cutting them out or reducing them considerably in the diet, is, is there anything else? It's probably worth checking if, if they have anything that blocks aspirin. Aspirin's basically salicylate. Now, in, what's interesting about that one is it's an example of something that if you have an intolerance, of course you need it out of the diet. But there's good reason to believe that for the rest of us, having quite a few salicylates, it's a bit like taking very low dose aspirin, which is maybe not the worst thing. So while some people need to cut it out, other people cutting it out unnecessarily, probably not doing yourself too many favours. But yeah, sorry, I don't know what else you can do other than keep it low. Any other questions? Okay, the question is what about stevia? Well, it, it looks okay, as in it, what I know about it, uh, it, is, it is something that comes directly from plants, as, as do some other, like the sugar alcohols, uh, and the worst thing that can usually happen with too many of the, the, the natural non-calorie sweeteners is if you have too much, uh, you just get a bit bloated and have a bit of diarrhea, and that's generally about it. So. If someone is desperate for a sweetener, I'd go with stevia. It, it all depends on, on your why. Why are you going for a, a sweetener? If it's because you've got sugar cravings, maybe not using any sweetener for a, a week or two will get rid of those cravings, and the sweetener will just keep exacerbating it. But if you've got some other reason, maybe stevia is a, yeah, I'd probably go with stevia over aspartame any day. Okay, so, so the question was simply with the suggestion of taking fish oil kind of in, in, in somewhat more concentrated doses two to three times weekly rather than daily if we need to stay at a level. I would have as much as is recommended on the bottle. Over, so if you think the daily recommendation, seven days in a week, work out what the weekly recommendation would be then split it to two or three. Uh, really with excessive amounts of fish oil, the risk uh, is basically that you bleed much more easily. But the, the amount that you would take based on what's on the bottle is not going to get you there. Uh, it's, it's not going to be put you at risk of, of bleeding excessively. Uh, populations that, that, like the Inuit, who eat a lot, or used to, eat lots and lots and lots of fish oil, yes, bleeding there was an issue, but you'd, you'd have to take far more than far more than is on the label. So, uh, no, this. I wouldn't restrict it on that basis. My main concern is this whole issue of some of it might be rancid. Why not? Can I just ask, I'm quite bad with um, different types of fish oil. Um, I mean, it's so fastidious with fussy and good presentations of what they'll eat. I sometimes eat the same meal over two years, exactly the same every night. To get fruits and vegetables and things like that, it just won't be true. Why? 